As we continue our study in the Gospel of John, we are now in chapter 4, and we have some introductory verses before the actual conversation that the Lord had with the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, the conversation recorded in this chapter, it's, it's unusual. A respected Jewish man would not normally talk to a woman at all alone, and a religious Jewish man would not want to talk to a Samaritan at all, much less a Samaritan woman. So this conversation, which is a part of the history of Jesus Christ, also includes beautiful and profound theology. This was discussed briefly in one of the videos in the introduction. This is a place where we see real history teaches real theology. It's wonderful. This is a wonderful and rich passage. There are two contrasts in this passage. There's the contrast between the well water and the living water, and there's a contrast between Jacob and the Lord Jesus. This event is not at all recorded in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but harvest as a figure of speech is used in Matthew 9, 37, and 38. Then he says to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest that he would send out workers into his harvest. And also, the need for physical bread to be set aside in favor of the spiritual is clear in the Lord's temptation in the wilderness, as described in the early verses of Matthew 4. Ephraim the Syrian summarizes this passage nicely for us. Here's a translation of his summary. Jesus came to the fountain as a hunter. He threw a grain before one pigeon that he might catch the whole flock. At the beginning of the conversation, he did not make himself known to her. But first she caught sight of a thirsty man, then a Jew, then a rabbi. Afterwards, a prophet. Last of all, the Messiah. She tried to get the better of the thirsty man, She showed her dislike of the Jew. She heckled the rabbi. She was swept off her feet by the prophet, and she adored the Christ. Wonderful summary by a man named Ephraim the Syrian. So chapter 4, verse 1. When, therefore, the Lord knew that the Pharisees heard that Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, well, just a note here, My translation was, when therefore the Lord knew, the best manuscripts, I think old and best and majority, all say Lord. Some manuscripts say Jesus. It's just not a better reading. It should be the Lord. When therefore the Lord knew. So apparently in 325 through 36, there were Jews who tried to incite jealousy between John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus. In 327 through 30, John the Baptist suppressed that attempt. In this section, the Lord Jesus is also shunned in a different attempt. Perhaps these words prepare the reader to better understand the conversation that took place at Sychar. Jesus didn't want to play politics, and he did not have a hypocritical attitude like the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Chapter 4, verse 2. Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples. Back in 3.22, we read that Jesus baptized, but here we read that it was actually his disciples that, that did the baptizing. And we hear nothing of this in the Synoptic Gospels. Although some would be glad to call this a contradiction, it's well within the norms of speech to say that a certain person did something when, in fact, his servants, or in this case, his disciples, did it. Note that in Mark 6.16, Herod the Tetrarch said that he beheaded John. Well, Herod the Tetrarch certainly did not take a sword and cut off John the Baptist's head. In Mark 6, 27, we see that it was actually Herod's executioner that did it. And look also in John 19, 39, we read there that Nicodemus brought 175 pounds of spices to the Lord's tomb. But surely some servants helped him with that heavy load. John 4, 2 and John 3, 22 certainly do not contradict each other. Chapter 4, verse 3. 
he left Judea and departed to Galilee. It seems that he was not interested in any more competition among the followers of John and his followers. Possibly, also, he left because he wasn't being received there. W doesn't give his motivation for leaving. Chapter 4, verse 4. But it was necessary for him to pass through Samaria. Well, a note about Samaria first. In 1 Kings 16.24, Omri, king of the northern kingdom, bought a hill in Samaria from a man named Shemer for two silver talents. He made a city on that hill, and he named it Samaria, in honor of Shemer, Samaria Shemer, the former owner of the hill. Over time, the term Samaria came to refer to the whole area. But back to our verse. It was necessary for him to pass through Samaria. The wording of this verse is very interesting. There were other routes that the Lord could have taken. In a way, it wasn't really necessary, but it was necessary. The route through Samaria must have been the most direct route, straight north. But religious Jews would not go that way lest they defile themselves through contact with the despised Samaritans. Those Jews would go down to the east, down into the Jordan River Valley, and then north through the Jordan River Valley to Galilee. But the Lord Jesus would have none of that. It was necessary for him to pass through Samaria because he would not follow this hateful attitude of religious Jews. He would not avoid Samaritans because they were not so-called pure. He came to save them. This is a reminder to us that racial discrimination has no place in the life of a follower of Christ. Just a reminder, Colossians 3.11 says, where there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, foreigner, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. At the time when Jesus spoke with this woman, hostility between Jews and Samaritans already had a long history. The kingdom of Israel split from the kingdom of Judah, as recorded, for instance, in 2 Chronicles 10 and 11. Later, the tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom, they were defeated by the Assyrians. You can see 2 Kings 17, 23 through 41 for that. Many of the Israelites in that northern kingdom were taken away to for various foreign lands, and many pagan people were settled in that northern kingdom. They brought their idols with them, and certainly many of the remaining Israelites joined them in that false worship. Now, just remember, that sort of mixing did not happen when later the southern kingdom was conquered and sent into captivity into Babylon. It, they weren't dispersed among the nations, and pagan nations were not brought into Judea. So it's a diff it was a different situation, and the situation in the north caused this influx of pagan thinking in the north. So over time, the people in what came to be known as Samaria, they left the gods of those people, but their traditions and customs of worshiping God were not the same as the Jews in Judea or Galilee. For example, the Samaritans, sort of Jews, <laughs> they only considered the five books of Moses to be God's word. They did not want to join the Jews uh, of Judea worshiping God in the temple in Jerusalem. So in 400 BC, they built their own temple on Mount Gerizim so that they wouldn't have to go down to Judea, to Jerusalem, and worship in the Jewish temple. Well, in years later, that was 400 BC, in 128 BC, Jews came up from Judea and burned that Mount Gerizim Samaritan temple. This is hostility. Samaritans and Jews were suspicious of one another, hated one another. The Lord Jesus' trip from Judea to Galilee through Samaria 
became proof that he rejected that racism and that hatred. Each one, every one truly following Jesus, must also refuse all racism and that sort of hatred. Those who hang on to their racism are not followers of Jesus because they do not have his attitude in this. Chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore he came into the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the land which Jacob gave to his son. So Old Testament background here would be in Genesis 33, 18 through 19, Genesis 48, 21 and 22, Joshua 24, 32. These tell the story of Jacob and Joseph's connection to this area. So now, near the town of Shechem, between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, at the edge of the road from Jerusalem to Galilee, there's a village named Askar, about 80 meters from the city of Shechem, and about one kilometer from the city of Askar, there is today a well, which according to strong tradition was dug by Jacob. The ruins of Sychar, the Greek term is Sukhar or Sukar, have not been found, but Sukar or English Sychar may be another name for Shechem or Askar. Chapter 4, verse 6. And there was there a well of Jacob's. Therefore Jesus, being tired from the journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The term translated well here is the Greek word pege, and it indicates that this well is a running spring. So apparently this source of water was a dug out well fed by an underground spring producing water from the time of Jacob until today. The OT, the Old Testament, does not tell of Jacob digging a well, but that doesn't mean that his men didn't dig this well. Today, Jacob's well is still there. When I visited this site in about 1980, it was surrounded by the ruins of an old church building. That well still has water. I remember the priests there would pull up water, and if you wanted to, you could drink from that well. The sixth hour was noon, halfway through a 12-hour day. Noon. The word which had become flesh was tired from the journey. He was truly man. Except for problems resulting from our sins, except for sins, he experienced all the weaknesses that we have as human beings. So, Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 here set us up. They orient us for this conversation that the Lord Jesus had with a woman at that well and the resulting effect on the village there. 